Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the AIB Pavilion um, on the December 10th <laughs> at uh, the Expo COP28, sorry. Um, can we have Mr. Rofi um, to do the opening remarks and then we'll start with the panel session. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, especially uh, Mr. Pradeep for, and uh, Francisco Jose, okay. and Dr. Saleh Baraba is here already, and all these distinguished speakers, participants, good afternoon to all of you. Um, First of all, I would like to thank UNDP and AIIB for facilitating this session. This is so timely for us, especially for Indonesia, to start looking at the potential collaboration and to support on the, to tackling on the one of national issue that is in line with decarbonization effort uh, now that we are talking about the whole weeks. So as a nation currently experiencing rapid economic growth, Indonesia is faced with formidable waste generation, including plastic packaging waste. Data shows that in the year of 2021, Indonesia generates around 68.5 million tons of domestic waste, where uh, food waste uh, portion is around 41%, and plastic waste around 18%. The worrying is the plastic waste is increasingly significantly for the last 10 years, which counted to around 11% only in the year 2010. So um, almost doubles within 10 years. And uh, un around 37% of the domestic waste are still unmanageable properly. And that is the potential leakage to the environment. While most of the waste, around 48%, are still dumped into the landfill area. So this is a challenge for uh, Indonesia, how to really uh, manage our uh, waste, especially from domestic waste. Since 2018, the government of Indonesia has issued various policies on, to improve waste management in a more integrated way, upstream to downstream, and encourage a circular economy. We have set an ambitious target to manage domestic waste and to reduce the plastic waste leakage into the ocean. In line with that, the government issued president regulation concerning marine debris. Uh, keep a direction for us for collaborative effort of various parties to reduce and marine plastic waste with ambitious measures uh, targets. Under this regulation, the government set a marine plastic waste reduction target of 70% to be achieved by 2025. So within the last four years, from 2018 until 2022, we have succeeded to reduce around 35.36% of the leakage compared to the numbers of the 2018. So we have way to go to the 70% for uh, another two years. And hopefully, uh, we usually we count the, 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 the waste reduction at the end of the year. So we, we have not yet the, the data of 2023, but hopefully it will uh, exceed 40% reduction uh, by 2023. So at this moment, we are also transforming our waste management from linear into a more circular one. Various innovation and technologies are started to be applied to be able to process waste into various products, such as recycling materials, mostly from plastics, uh, to RDF, refuse drive fuel, that also uh, used as a source of energy, uh, co-firing into cement industry mainly, and also we are now trying to, to 
to reduce the coal uh, utilization at the uh, power plant with SRF, uh, also uh, coming from the uh, uh, organic waste. Of course, govern government cannot work alone to overcome these challenging uh, in waste management. Collaboration with various parties is very important. So we are ap appreciating UNDP, AIIB, and other strategic partners that have been supporting Indonesia to deal with this I important issue. I can show some lot of good uh, pilots that is, is, that is working now in Indonesia and with the support from various partners. Um, we've been uh, assessing uh, regarding the, the needs of the investment and uh, financial support for uh, handling this uh, uh, marine plastic debris and waste management in general. So through the National Plastic Action Partnership, we calculated the, the private public partnership uh, effort to realizing uh, this uh, ambitious target uh, achievement. So we will require investment cost of a total 5.1 billion US dollar and budget for operating funds around 1.1 billion per year by 2025, mainly to running a waste, a waste management system and, and effective recycling. So this is a huge gap actually, uh, if we compare with the national uh, budget capacity, uh, uh, also sub-regional uh, budget capacity uh, with these uh, uh, numbers or, or the needs of the financial to, 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 to achieve our uh, national target. So I think this is uh, our potential collaboration with partners from the banks or other uh, financial institution to really work together. We have the roadmap actually already so and we have already some uh, scheme that is is running now we can we can, we can uh, uh, see at our pilot or uh, startup that we can we can uh, grow grow uh, on together. So uh, lastly we are now here in, in Dubai, mostly speaking about the climate crisis and uh, decarbonization. But when we are talking about decarbonization, we mostly focus on energy, forest, for energy and forest mainly, because that's the 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 the, 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 the big things that uh, we people concern, concerning on. However, we must not forget that decarbonization from waste waste sector is also important. As the waste sector contribute to the reduction of uh, GSG, Indonesia itself has targeted waste sector as part of the national determined uh, contribution target. So it's, I think it's around 7 to 10 percent uh, reduction of the uh, GSG in Indonesia will be, hopefully will be coming from the waste sector. So through collaboration in better waste management and implementing a circular economy, together we have made a real contribution to climate action. So hopefully from this uh, session we can uh, see uh, the possibilities uh, on, of investment or collaboration with uh, Indonesia to, 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 to increase our capacity in uh, dealing with uh, waste management, including uh, dealing with the marine plastic pollution. Thank you very much. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Rafi. Um, I'm not, you can't escape because I do want you up here. Yes, yes, please. So why don't the, the panelists also come up here because we're going to have a, a conversation. And let's see whether we can get anywhere on this question of scaling up climate um, and nature, a positive uh, investment in least developed countries. Um, I mean, clearly, just to link it to the conversations that taking place here at COP28, we know that scaling finance is going to be absolutely critical. Um, we know that public 
funding alone is not going to be uh, sufficient given that we need trillions of dollars uh, to enter uh, the decarbonization world. And in fact, when you break up those trillions, you do end up with the, the type of examples that uh, Rofi talked about, uh, where you have to leverage uh, and crowd in you know, $5 billion uh, for various investments. Um, but it's not happening. And it's not happening at the pace that we need it to happen. So I really want to have a conversation with, with all of you uh, to try and elicit uh, some ideas of what do you think will work, um, given that all of you represent key actors in society that must come together. Uh, private sector, institutional investors, uh, development organizations. I'm sure we have colleagues here who represent civil society and so on. So let's see whether we can have a conversation about uh, what we think uh, needs to happen. Because I am a little bit frustrated that that is not coming out in some of these conversations. And I think, as we all agree, this is the hottest year, I think. Now, that's, that's almost that's scientifically uh, confirmed. It's going to get hotter. We don't have time. So we need to act now. So in that context, and this is going to be an open question to all of you, um, so please do volunteer yourself. What do you think is, from your standpoint of the institution you represent, um, one of the primary constraints uh, or constraining factors that um, is impeding the flow of scaled up financing for nature or climate? Who wants to take a crack at that? Craig, I'm going to put you on the spot. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> uh, um, okay. I sort of thought I'd be, I, I thought I'd be called on. Um, I, I, I think the answer, in, in, to some extent, um, is, as we've talked before, yeah, we need to accelerate scale and replicate projects, companies, et cetera. Um, that's very clear. Um, as an investment fund that focuses on the global south, um, there's too much difficulty also getting people to move on the investment side into the global south. AIB is obviously set up to do that, which is wonderful. And I think to get things done, I, we have the answer here in many ways. We have institutional investors, project finance. We have, I think, an entrepreneurial private sector fund. We have folks we need, and I can elaborate on each of these, like UNDP, who we work closely with. We need the government with policy, and we need corporate. I mean, a key part for us, which we've really been talking a lot over COP, whether it's regenerative agriculture, waste, for us as an investor, is offtake, and forward-thinking companies like Danone. So um, as I look, I think we sort of have an answer here, and we're working closely. We can talk about that, but it's a combination of getting us all to move. I mean, we, we're a blended finance fund with the GCF, but we've talked about parallel finance. We need parallel partnerships to expand on that. Right. So um, then let me turn to the bank. Maybe you start with, um, uh, let, let me go to uh, Sani first. Um, Craig has just talked about needing to bring partners together. I mean, as a bank, what's your strategy? What, what's your focus? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And uh, I'm glad, glad you mentioned the word partnerships, right? Because AIB uh, is one of the newest MDBs uh, established in 2016 uh, in the aftermath of the Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. So as such, uh, we really, um, it is written in our DNA to uh, work together with partner institutions, including those from MDBs, but other development financing institutions, UN agencies with uh, in-depth country knowledge and capacity like yourselves, as well as the private sector, in achieving our mandate uh, to promote sustainable economic uh, development in Asia and beyond. Right. So can I, can I press you on that? Like in your strategy, what is it that makes the AIIB strategy unique uh, in order to facilitate the kind of partnerships we're talking about? 
Right. So uh, this year in September at our annual meeting in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, uh, we have launched the first um, AIB's climate action plan. And in this action plan, um, we have um, reiterated our existing commitments on climate, uh, of which I would mention two in particular. So the 50% climate finance target by 2025, uh, which we have already exceeded uh, in 2022. We were at 56%, but of course, um, we need to maintain uh, that level going forward and also increase the share of adaptation versus mitigation finance therein. And secondly, uh, we also uh, have committed to Paris align all new investment operations starting from uh, July of this year. Uh, so in effect, it's already uh, uh, applicable to all of our uh, new projects, whether direct or indirect, working with public sector and private sector clients. And so uh, in that uh, climate action plan, one of the, I would say, truly innovative aspects is um, there are four principles and second principle about impact, uh, it, uh, it is um, calling for a truly holistic approach in dealing with uh, the climate and the global nature and biodiversity crisis, right? So yesterday was Nature Day at the COP28 and uh, we actually had an event on this topic, how to, uh, to deal with these parallel priorities in an uh, integrated manner. So this is uh, truly the approach that we are uh, championing in our um, climate action plan. And, and, and similarly, I would also mention the, um, the economic department's flagship report, which was also launched at this COP on nature as infrastructure, whereby we believe that by financing um, you know, natural assets, forests, mangroves, coral reefs, uh, uh, for their infrastructure functions, right. uh, such as um, water and wastewater treatment, for example, um, you know, uh, we can better achieve the co-benefits uh, right. of climate and uh, nature in, in developing countries. Great. I'm, I'm going to switch to Francisco. You're, you're a senior investment operations specialist uh, at yes. the bank. Um, you know, we wouldn't normally associate bankers to know anything about nature or climate. <laughs> Um, and, but that has to change, obviously. So from where you sit, when you see these proposals coming to you and investment opportunities, what do you see? What are your sort of main pain points that we need to try and overcome? Yes, it's a very important question because I think uh, the key change that is happening now with the publication of the uh, Asian Infrastructure Finance Report is that the bank starts to see nature as an investable asset class. Right. This is fundamental because it's well, a paradigm I, wh what shift. What makes it an investable asset class? Can you expand a little bit on that? Well, you need to, first of all, value it. Mm -hmm. You need to understand that it has an intrinsic value, that its preservation has also reverts into uh, well, society, but also on the value of the project itself, and uh, that it's quantifiable in some way. Now we have computational capacity that we didn't right. have 20, 30, 50 years ago, and we can identify data that allows us to measure much better the impacts of our projects and not only mitigate or avoid impacts on nature, but also try to uh, restore, try to add nature as a component in the project design. And I think project design is the very fundamental point. I think it all boils down to the incentives. Mm -hmm. If there is an incentive, in the policy, in the tariff, in the, um, in the way um, projects are remunerated as per their normal functioning. That's what triggers everything. That's what unleashes uh, right. nature uh, as an investable class. Then after that, as investors, we can look at different nudges or uh, incentives embedded in the financing. Like for example, sustainability linked loans uh, that can um, promote certain behaviors that are consistent with nature uh, uh, restoration goals. So right. that's, for example, uh, an application from our side that we could uh, try to, to, to promote from, uh, from the investment angle. Okay, so we have the banks and the institutional investors willing to go into a space yeah. on nature and climate. I want to come to you and Danon, private sector. Uh, how do you see things from where you sit in terms of your supply chains um, and the risks that you face and what you want to try and do about it? Yes, uh, for us the big uh, uh, risk is related to finance the transition for uh, the small uh, actors 
or players in the value chain. And they are the, the, the bigger in terms of uh, their footprint. So, so we, we, we made this year uh, uh, very bold commitments regarding uh, regenerative agriculture, regarding methane. And this is because we know that our uh, carbon footprint is related to that. And, and, and if we want to accelerate, because you mentioned no, the urgency, and yeah. it's a matter of accelerate uh, uh, your action plan and your transformation, we need to find out how to finance it. And as Craig mentioned, we are <laughs> on this table, no, the ones who can accelerate it. We need to find out the models that uh, 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 can help us to uh, achieve uh, the, 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 this, this transformational uh, goals. And it's a matter of policies. A lot of it's policies, and Francisco mentioned, uh, I think, w quite well, that you need to have, have the right incentives in those policies to align the actors towards uh, 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 those in incentives. So in, w in our case, uh, the transformation of the dairy industry no, requires a lot of uh, 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 creativity in the financing models that we need to have for the, 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 the dairy farmers, for example. But it's not only that. With packaging, we need also to find out how we are going to finance no, uh, the triple R, no? how to reduce no, the amount of virgin plastic, how to recollect in order to uh, 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 reuse no, and how to recycle no, those materials. So it's, it's a lot of money if you want to uh, 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 be ready no, uh, according to the, the, the climate change uh, targets. So, so those are two examples of what we are doing. So we signed uh, uh, an agreement with UNDP in order to develop in those two uh, uh, subjects, uh, projects that target how to accelerate with communities and with the rest of the stakeholders, uh, 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 projects that are going to help us to, 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 to boost, to promote the transition right. uh, to a decarbonated uh, economy. Okay, so now uh, I want to come to you, Rafi, because you know Indonesia is a country that all of us are currently converging uh, to try and see whether we can bring different pieces of this puzzle together to try and ensure that at the country level, at a localized level, you can scale up uh, investment towards uh, waste and, and waste management practices. From where you sit, what do you see as the key elements of what you need in Indonesia to try and scale up interventions like the ones we're talking about? Uh, yes. Well, if we are talking about the waste management, it's compli yes. complex things. Uh, well, plastic. Yeah. You pick plastic, the plastic right? Plastic, yeah. uh, for example. So um, the, the intervention should be up, uh, from upstream. You mentioned about reduction from the production itself. We, we now, now the, the terminology of be, uh, we, we think we need to think about how to collect and to, to recycle plastic before it made as a, a, a packaging, for example. So, so that's one thing that uh, we need also support from the company like Danone, for example, to make sure that uh, the collection and recycle uh, can be maximized. In Indonesia, we still have a problem with the collection, for example. We really rely on the af uh, availability of the informal sectors to collect plastic waste. So we need al also investment from, from the uh, in terms of EVR, for example, from the, 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 the private sectors to, to, to support us how really to collect and how to really make it uh, uh, come to the, what they call the recycle uh, stream. So, so, so this is very important. In Indonesia, it's re 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 recycling rate is really low now, around 10 to 11 percent. And it is also dominated by PET which is more higher value, right. other uh, plastic is still uh, 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 really low. So this is so challenging, uh, how we can really put 
everything uh, the plastic into a recycle uh, stream. That one more thing. Secondly, is about the uh, uh, changing behavior of the the people, the community. I think uh, this is our uh, government uh, focus uh, on how to really um, not uh, campaigning now, pushing, but more pushing people to, to change their mindset on plastic waste, especially how they really can uh, have uh, understanding how to uh, uh, segregate plastics from, from start from housing to, 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 to mix it really segregate not mixed in, into uh, with the other type of uh, waste because it's I think it's, uh, the, um, the, the main challenge is when the plastic is already mixed with with other type of place that everything will go to the landfill it's not easy to, to, to really uh, recycle that one so that's also uh, challenging and the last part is uh, on the technology itself we need a more investment on the recycling we need more investment on the waste management uh, facility. Uh, we, we have some examples, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have like waste to energy now in Indonesia, converting like uh, 1,000 ton of waste per day to become an uh, electricity for some right. we, we, we have already, but one is not enough for Indonesia. So we need also uh, need more investment from, from uh, yeah. It can be blended finance, actually. We have blended finance scheme and also, uh, I give you an, another example uh, with Danone. Danone also have like uh, investing uh, small facility for the city scale uh, 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 waste management facility. Uh, Danone work with the private sector company in Indonesia and uh, Providing investment uh, with a low rate uh, uh, um, in interest mm -hmm. to become running, and then it helps a lot because no one would like to to really invest on the waste with, with it is not come to the economic scale. But I think with this part of uh, commitment or EPR from the, the the private sectors, it can support uh, private. Uh, small private companies to, to, to run and help local government to, 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 to manage the, the waste. Right. So. so maybe, Craig, I'll come back to you. Um, UNDP is very active in Indonesia. We get involved in uh, supporting policy de-risking efforts, uh, regulatory reform work, uh, helping governments to come up with the right incentives for the, for the private sector. Uh, we work at the community level uh, through our small grants program where informal sector is very much um, uh, the focus of, of, of many of our interventions. Surely this must be a valuable uh, capability uh, that then allows and gives you the confidence as an investor to try and come in. I mean, what, do you, what are your thoughts? So I think every, first, every situation is different. When we think about waste collection, um, particularly in, as a, a country like Indonesia, which obviously has huge population centers, but is also dispersed. Um, working with communities, it's incredibly valuable. Um, having you on the ground, U UNDP's boots, working with policy makers, working with local communities, that's not our expertise. And yeah. we, we love to partner with someone like UNDP, to, like, and we're already doing that. Um, that can make things much easier. easier. Um, in countries, again, smaller than Indonesia, like the Maldives, Sri Lanka, it's absolutely critical. Um, but I think in Indonesia, particularly in the remote islands, that, that's especially important. Um, I think also working to figure out policy frameworks, um, you know, plastics may be a little different because there's more intrinsic value, but with waste management, obviously tipping fees are a major subject. Working, particularly if it's not the central government, working we have a subnational climate fund. Yeah. Working with regional or municipalities, I think UNDP also has a critical role to play for us. There's some things we can't invest in. We can't invest in a seawall, as an example. That's I'd like right. to. So, but then I think we have to remember there are things that the public sector has to do, but there's a huge number of areas in the waste sector with the right policies, the right economics, um, and again, the partnerships. Um, 
we're ready to invest. Fabrizio, I want to bring you into this now because if, you know, given what you just heard about what UNDP is doing and what Craig is willing to do and what he has asked about the support that Danone can provide in terms of maximizing collection, how does that, how would you come in as a, as a company? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I, I have uh, some examples that can show us uh, how we are trying to lead uh, uh, the transformation. Uh, one is related to a developed country, to Spain, where we will launch, uh, we launched last uh, month uh, the the BACA report. We we we, we say the BACA report because it's a, 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 a word, uh, no, a game, no, in terms of BACA, it's cow in Spanish but it's with a B of uh, low carbon. So it's a report that it's the first strategy to, uh, for the de de decarbonization of the dairy value chain. And what we did, we put together all the stakeholders, all the relevant, relevant stakeholders, government, uh, academia, scientists, farmers, uh, distributors, the companies, in order to discuss how to measure no, the uh, footprint of the dairy value chain uh, and to develop the recommendations for the decarbonization. So it was a consensus. So it's the first consensus with all the, 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 the relevant stakeholders involved and with a clear roadmap on how to move forward. So you have a clear role no, uh, also with the financial institution what, where you know what is your uh, share no? and the role to play. This is an example of a developed country, but we did the same thing in Morocco and in Mexico regarding the uh, uh, small farmers in the dairy industry. We work with 10,000 uh, farmers in Morocco and we know for sure no, how, what are their needs no, uh, to accelerate the transformation. So what we need is to find out how we're going to finance it and how we're going to valorize it. Because the problem there is when you put the money, you need to recover it yeah. fr from somewhere. So, so in Spain, it's clear that in a developed country, you can market dairy, a dairy product that's a low carbon dairy product, which is attractive for consumers because you know some consumers have, have left the category because of the carbon impact. Yeah. So, so you have a valorization there. How to do it with small countries or with underdeveloped countries. So, so, so that's the challenge. And in the example of the, of, the, of the way speaking, if you don't do it with the communities, you are not going to achieve results. Yeah. So, so because of the informal way speakers, you need to involve them in, as economical uh, actors right. in the process. So that, that's the way we are trying so, to move So uh, I'm, I'm curious now, for a, for a private company, why would you invest in that? Well, why are you spending money on, on, it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, because it's the sustainability of our business. It's the sustainability, the, 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 the protection and defense of the dairy category pass through the decarbonization of the dairy category, for sure. And we find out that uh, yogurt, for example, we are the number one yogurt producer in the world. Uh, it could be the less carbon intensive animal protein in the world. So we're going to claim it for sure because we're working for that. So that's an example because it's the sustainability of our business. When we uh, talk about waters, for example, no, the waters, uh, it, it's a, 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 a category associated to plastic because of the packaging. The share of plastic, it's yeah. unrelevant. But yeah. it's really visible. So we need to achieve the full circularity on packaging to protect this category, which is the, the most healthy beverage, mineral, natural water. We sell that. We don't sell carbonated uh, soft drinks or whatever. We sell mineral water. So this is also something that we need to do for the sustainability of our business in the long term. Right. So maybe I'll turn to my colleagues from AIIB now. Um, clearly, there seems to be investment opportunities here from what you're hearing, either, uh, um, you know, uh, Sani or, or, or uh, sorry, Francisco. Um, what, what do you feel is there for you as a bank in what you're hearing? Well, uh, 
from purely from the investment operations side, I think we can see that the incentives are there uh, from uh, from various aspects. There are moral incentives and there are also economic incentives. Right. And I think this is very important. So what is in there for us? Um, what we need to uh, find as a priority is ways of scaling up financing. I mean, because for us, uh, scale is very important. Um, we spend the same amount of time doing a 10 million project than doing a 100 million project. So for us, the entire discussion is about what is the best mechanism that allows us to reach the maximum impact with a relatively limited effort, uh, but with the right actors, with the right uh, incentives embedded into First of all, the project. Second, the, the financing structure. So, um, projects that allow us to reach this, um, now looking at it from the point of view of nature, uh, net gain uh, position, are in uh, many cases are the sovereign backed financings because those ones allow us to move at a very large, uh, move very large amounts of money into projects, into um, multiple end uses uh, when there is a, a central authority, for example, determining which are the priority projects. We have seen this in China, for example, where we have uh, approximately $1 billion pipeline uh, for projects that have uh, quite a marked um, net gain uh, element when it comes to nature. But that's not everything we can do. We also need to now move towards uh, more uh, private sector financing, or what we call non-sovereign financing, uh, that includes also municipalities, um, mm -hmm. uh, regional authorities, so different actors that do not rely on this element of sovereign-backed financing and find the ways of channeling this support. Um, financial institutions is one uh, way of reaching out to this type of projects. Uh, if we are looking at small-scale uh, uh, investments that I think is one area that we can uh, we can f uh, focus on. Funds where we participate as an LP is another one. We can look into funds that invest in nature-based solutions and that are trying to reach out to the smaller projects that we were not able to do directly. And the other one is maybe corporate finance. Corporate finance is also a very powerful tool because you have large corporates, for example Danone, or also utilities or um, uh, water companies that can uh, identify across complex networks multiple interventions that ultimately, in aggregate, right. represent a net gain. So we have this this type of uh, of clients. And now, when we come to to the type of instruments we have mentioned before, sustainability link loans is one element. We can also look at blended finance as another aspect. So if we can bring some non-commercial concessional element philanthropic uh, funding into a project together with commercial funding, that is a success for us. Craig, I'm going to come back. Oh, do you want to add something? Please. Please. Yes, uh, thank you. Just from the strategic perspective, I think I really, what the speaker said here really resonates with the, uh, um, like the vision that AIB has in terms of financing, well, not just climate finance projects and nature finance projects, but in general, I think, um, Again, one of the uh, climate action plan principles is being country driven, right? So we're um, by uh, creation of project financing bank and we finance what countries uh, have as a priority for their uh, climate development and biodiversity strategies. So to hear that, you know, in, within the waste sector, a big client as Indonesia, our number five uh, biggest recipient country is trying to decarbonize while at the same time considering their uh, the biodiversity and nature impacts uh, is, is very much encouraging um, so uh, that's one thing I wanted to highlight but also what Francisco was saying that actually we do finance uh, public and private sector clients so we have a 50% goal uh, to scale up the uh, non sovereign back financing uh, of part of the operations by 2030 and so actually um, Speaking of, uh, you know, corporates like Danone, we have a um, a couple of cases where we invested in a, a corporate bond portfolios of companies. There is one 500 million uh, uh, called the Asia Climate Bond Portfolio, uh, and there is another one on ESG bonds. So it's really great to hear that you know from the company side how proactive they are on the decarbonization, uh, and it's something certainly we can also work together on. So it's it's one thing to talk about the Indonesia's of the world. But we know this is not where the needs are only. 
we have least developed countries, we have fragile states, uh, we have small islands uh, where you don't have size of market, uh, you have much more uh, difficult conditions. But yet, we cannot ignore these uh, you know, uh, locations either. Um, um, what is it, Craig, that you, know, you look to, for example, when you decide to invest in places like Comoros uh, or other uh, you know, uh, locations that don't have all the ideal infrastructure in place, such as Indonesia? Uh, so well maybe since we're in Asia, well, let's talk about the Maldives, okay, let's talk about which the is Maldives, one of our countries yeah. in the Coral Reef Fund. Probably not to known, you're probably not in the Maldives. Um, we're talking <laughs> about Mexico, Morocco, and um, Indonesia together. But um, in the Maldives, um, with our Coral Reef Fund, we're the only ocean fund that's focused on the Global South, the only fund anywhere focused on coral reefs, um, the coral reef infrastructure is critical to livelihood in the Maldives. Um, we have to focus on areas where we can make money, and we may need help. We may need concessional finance. We may need philanthropy. We, we definitely need a UNDP. So to replace diesel as an example, maybe, um, and replace it with solar, um, and all the multiple islands, I think there's a total commercial case for it. Right. Um, we may need some government policy help, but um, the Maldives is powered by diesel. It's insanely expensive for them. Yeah. Solar, including offshore solar, floating solar, can and will work. It's harder because you have multiple islands. So again, a partnership with UNDP can make a big difference. Similarly, um, we can do ecotourism with marine protected areas. We need government help with that. We need to work with communities, but it can work. Plastic collection, we're actively doing something now, right. working with communities, and there we're using a partner. We've invested in Parlay for the Oceans, working again with UNDP, but they work with communities across the islands, and what they do is there we have a secret sauce. We don't have to know to take off take right. um, in a small island. So we work with a company that can repackage it, sell it to Europe at crazy prices to Adidas and um, yeah. Nike and LVMH, and we can make that work economically. In the Maldives, we have to be creative. Indonesia, the fundamentals of a closed loop make much more sense. In, in countries like the Maldives, we have to structure. There, there's still things to do. Right. which I think are hugely impactful, but it requires a different train of thought. So uh, how do you as a bank then, you know, in working in some of these countries that are debt distressed and fiscal space is limited, um, what are some of the ways in which you are able to overcome those mm -hmm. challenges, making the financing available? Yes. Well, you, you have highlighted a very important conundrum, and, and it's the fact that Infrastructure at scale happens in more developed countries, in relatively more developed countries, because you need an economic base for that to happen. For infrastructure to be, to be sustainable from an economic perspective, you basically need a middle class that pays for the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And in many countries, this middle class doesn't exist, or it's not, it's, it's, it's too not large feeble, mm -hmm. not large enough to sustain the public service. Right. By recognizing nature as a class of infrastructure, I think that, is, that has a catalyst approach, a catalyst effect, because it allows people to start then focusing on the nature impacts, on the nature preservation, nature conservation in these more uh, vulnerable and least developed countries, but more as a public good, as a good that is globally relevant for not only the economies that are affected by, um, by uh, climate and natural erosion, but also that uh, by, uh, for, the, for the entire uh, world. Um, how do we overcome this? Well, uh, I think in the first step, banks like us have the possibility to mobilize, as I said, sovereign-backed financing, which provides very long-term quasi-concessional funding to many of these projects, because if you lend at 20, 30 years, you can uh, effectively uh, provide a, a good basis uh, of funding for relatively large projects. But um, many of these countries are trapped uh, in some type of, uh, um, uh, of over-indebtedness uh, in one form or another, so their capacity to borrow is not that great. Maybe other solutions uh, can be explored, uh, especially with mm -hmm. private sector or uh, 
concessional financing. But it's a, it's a good question. So, Rofi, maybe I'll come back to you again, because in Indonesia and the outer islands, uh, you know, remote locations, um, some of these issues that you have in the big cities uh, are similar. Uh, how are you going about tackling them in Indonesia? Yes, uh, thank you. Well, Indonesia is huge, and, uh, and uh, also uh, we, we have, like... Um, Population that is concentrated concentrated in Java Island. The most of our development is in Java Island, and um, all the industry is in Java, including recycling, uh, plastic recycling industry. So for the, the the small islands, mostly in the eastern part of Indonesia, it is hard really to to, to get the economic uh, uh, scale for the plastic recycling. Because they need to transfer to transport it to Java, which is it must more cost compared to the the, the, the value it plus itself. If we we are talking about economics, so that's why uh, we uh, we in government and also uh, company private sector need to incentivize this. Otherwise, there's not uh, there will not, not a sustainable there's sustainability on 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 that uh, scale. So yeah. We, we, are, we, we, we really uh, need to think this not only as business, but also our, um, uh, called, this is for our environment. Right. This is what we are talking all uh, about. So for the, all the big cities and uh, in uh, some, some other areas, there's some capacity actually from the local government. Infrastructure is better in, 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 the, in, the, in Java Island, for example. But we really need to think about the, the, the smaller island and, and the community itself that really dep dependent on, on the resources, uh, let's say marine resources, but at the same, same time they also have no capacity to, to, to manage their waste and they're, they're also right. vulnerable from other waste that's coming from, 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 from the sea. So this is also uh, the thing that we need to think about. So, Fabrice, I mean, maybe I'll ask you a little bit from a corporate perspective. Um, I totally understand, you know, focusing on certain markets because of scale, but from a corporate side perspective, I mean, do we really have no hope to work in smaller contexts where, you know, markets are, are a little bit more challenging? Uh, is there anything that could be done by the international community? Um, you know, we have grant-based instruments. We have concessional finance. There anything that could be done to sort of crowd in corporate interest in places that may not be so obvious? Yes, for sure. Uh, for me, it's a matter of finding the right partners. Hmm. In the places you are small, there are others that are big. So you need to identify them. Right. So you cannot lead uh, in, in, in any geography, but you can find uh, the, 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 the actors, the key players that are uh, the leaders there that they can uh, move things forward so 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 yes for me there's hope for a small uh, countries really uh, poor under the developed countries because uh, it's a matter of how to valorize the outcome of those investments and right. we we need to think with that approach it's okay. not something that we're doing just for the sake of the planet it's yeah. for uh, an economical purpose right. in the long term, and if you 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 achieve to show them this, you are going to 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 go faster. Great, Craig. I do you feel like you want to come in. Oh, please go ahead. So I, I I think that's an important comment. I mean, we look frequently with smaller countries and regional areas like West Africa. We can start in Senegal. It may be too small individually, but knowing when we were talking earlier about cold storage, we starting in Morocco. We're, heading to Tunisia, other places, um, understanding it's a growth platform we can invest in, we, we can do that. Now, when we talk about the Maldives or Cormoros, we're pushing the most challenging countries yeah. um, because you don't have the ability realistically to regionalize. But I, whether it's Central America, South America, again, Africa, um, or Southeast Asia, I think ignoring Indonesia, which obviously is a, a, mar a market to itself, I do think you can regionalize, look at platforms, and get economies of scale and markets. And I think that's a crucial way, at least we look at things. Great, San 
Thank you. I just wanted to touch upon a point you mentioned about the importance of um, kind of um, internalizing the externalities and educating governments uh, about the economic benefits of certain solutions, uh, nature-based solutions. And in our uh, bank, certainly we do use the, uh, the method of shadow carbon pricing when it comes to the carbon sequestration externality of sovereign-backed financing projects. And so the economics at the project level do uh, use that as a as a um, a way to uh, in a way price in the, the high emissions when we finance uh, fossil fuels for example or uh, the emission reductions when we finance uh, uh, clean energy for example and going forward it's something that we also want to do for other ecosystem services um, climate adaptation biodiversity conservation of our projects and by doing so I think when we have this kind of conversation with governments upstream business development or even during the pro, uh, due di project level due diligence we can bring this knowledge to our client countries and help them to uh, appreciate, evaluate this kind of uh, ecosystem services. And I think that will be able to uh, lead to some knock-on effects uh, in, the, in the long term. Okay, we're now coming to the end. Uh, we have about uh, two, three minutes left. So I'm going to give each of you a wish. Okay, so the wish I want you to Use this opportunity. If there was one thing that you would like to see done differently in order to try and scale finance for nature uh, and climate, and, and you know, please don't feel like you have to speak from your institutional perspective, but more as a human being that's part of uh, a planet where we all have to try and make this work, what is your wish? when it comes to mobilizing, catalyzing finance for climate and nature? I alluded to this earlier in, at the beginning. I think we have a fantastic computational capacity in this time and age, but we are not taking advantage of it fully. We use it for things that are, yes, they are important, like uh, talking to family and friends on social media and uh, use AI to, uh, to uh, sell things to each other but we don't seem to be tackling the big problems of the century, such as poverty, such as uh, uh, ecological degradation, uh, such as inequality, through the tools that we have at our disposal. So my wish would be that this information tools that we have available effectively can be used so that investors and projects can find each other easily in this maze that is today's, uh, today's world or today's uh, developing finance uh, world. Great. Greg? Uh, okay, I will speak not as an investor but as a citizen. Um, and this is something we've had conversations with Danone about. Um, we need to urgently face water and understand we are heading for multiple disasters in feeding people and getting drinking water and um, in for livelihoods, keeping people alive. So my wish is with today's water day, um, there's not a lot of going on about it. Um, we need to figure out how to price water, do water projects with incredible urgency. Tani? Thank you. So um, there is no equivalent of renewable energy in climate in nature, right? So even though we all spoke about the importance of uh, economic valuation of uh, you know ecosystem services that nature can provide in practice it doesn't yet translate into revenue streams which is what ultimately the private sector needs so if I could have a wish then I would wish that in the next few years we manage to collectively create the revenue streams uh, for nature to be come attractive to the private sector on a mainstream uh, um, scale. And just to uh, refer to something that happened earlier between our institutions this week, the, uh, we look forward to working very much with UNDP and other accredited entities to the global uh, environmental and climate funds, namely GCF, GEF, because I think we are not there yet, but together, uh, you know, with blended finance, we can demonstrate the feasibility and in some cases, uh, the financial revenues coming in from nature so that going forward, we can make it mainstream. Great. Fabrice? 
Thank you. I, um, my wish is more a dream, but uh, uh, for me, we're in a tipping point uh, when we put the uh, agri-food system no, in the center of the COP28. Uh, so, so, so my dream is that we achieve in the COP30, in two years, to identify uh, the, the, the food and agri-system as the main stream for acceleration for the 1.5 uh, degrees target. And I, be, I truly believe it is, because uh, uh, as, uh, as an example, in terms of the water uh, crisis and the water protection, 80% of the water uh, usage is agriculture. You need to solve it there. And, and we have many examples of uh, uh, climate uh, risks uh, related that are related to food and agriculture. So, so, so for me, that's my dream. And this is going to help us to finance it because it's going to be the uh, main, the first stream to bet, no, uh, to, 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 to tackle the climate change. Great. Rafi? Uh, okay, yes. Um, to be short, that uh, we share... What you wish? Yeah. We share these problems. We share these uh, uh, climate impacts together. So for the countries like Indonesia, which is uh, developing and uh, so many uh, uh, issues there, so collaborative action is very uh, important. Indonesia have uh, has strong commitment to, to contribute in, into this uh, uh, climate action, but again, we cannot do by Indonesia itself. We need to, to work together and... Um, um, just and smooth transition is very uh, important for right. countries like Indonesia. Well, I have good news. I'm going to grant you your wishes. Here's the thing, and I'm going to close with this. We have partnership agreements with all of you. Your instruments from the bank are incredibly important to augment the grant funding that UNDP brings. The reason we joined into this partnership with AIB is so that when we are deploying grant financing to expand on renewable energy in Africa or in the Maldives or wherever else, we can not only find the pipelining opportunities for your financing, but really bring our capabilities on the ground with yours. We can't do this without you, Craig, because you have access to institutional investors and you speak a language that we in the UN don't speak. We need your help to be brought together with what we are able to do with us. Your wish, why wait till two years from now, start today. UNDP's portfolio of interventions on agriculture in West Africa, in Latin America, uh, in Asia, is a platform on which to build, working at the community level. And finally, I'm going to grant your wish, because we strongly believe that we can't do this unless we collaborate. So I hope we really use this as a moment to move forward together, um, because, I mean, let's face it, we have to. There is no other choice, um, and the science uh, that is being released today, um, I mean, I have to say, you know, I, I need to now start thinking about whether I need to be having difficult conversations with my children about maybe it may not be a good idea to have kids, because 20 years from now, 40 years from now, it's going to be very difficult, and these are the very real implications of what is happening today. Either the science is completely wrong, but if it is right and there's no reason to doubt it, that is the implication. I don't know whether people realize. So, and I think, you know, I was just calculating in my head, given the amount of, you know, resourcing that AIIB sits on, you know, the, the, the two billion, two plus billion uh, portfolio that you have, you know, your multiple billions as, a, as, a, as an organization, as a corporate, the five billion that UNDP brings, I mean, together, if we can't collectively make an impact, then what? I mean, what else is left? So, 
uh, with that, I really hope we take this as an opportunity to band together and try and figure out some solutions and let's get it done. We don't have time. Thank you.